I want to thank you very much for coming. I think this will be an exciting workshop and a beginning of a long-term relationship. So you can become part of my, my Facebook page. You can see right there, that's my name, and that's the same name on my Facebook page. And that way, I will sometimes I post my workshops. Also, if you go to the East Hawaii Master Gardener page, the East Hawaii Master Gardener page has a calendar. You will see it on the right-hand side. If you look Google, East Hawaii Master Gardener, there's a calendar that has all the Master Gardener activity, but it also has all the CTAR activity. It combines the, the, the ones from the west side and the east side, and also my workshops. So if you want to keep up to date of what's going on in CTAR, you are welcome to visit our calendar. So the outline of our first talk, and by the way, there will be a couple topics. The first topic would be soil health and nematodes. That's the topic following that will be how to collect samples for nutrient analysis. Then Alisa Cho will give us how to will give us a talk on how to collect leaf samples for plant nutrient analysis, and then will be followed for Brian Bush. Okay, Brian Bush will um, talk to us how to collect plant samples for um, disease analysis, and then we'll have short outdoor demonstration. But now we will move on with our soil health and cover crop talk. So soil health is a combination of factors. It's kind of like human health. You know, in order to be healthy, you need to have healthy lungs, healthy brain, healthy, a whole bunch of things, right? Healthy immune system. Soil health is made of more than just one factor, okay? Soil health is made out of soil biology and also some soil physical characteristics, like the structure of the soil. And soil structure, it's how the particles are joined together. Now, soil structure is really important. When the soil is undisturbed and the soil has a lot of plants and a lot of organic matter, the soil aggregates, pieces of soil, kind of glue together, like um, microorganisms glues and, and also little mycorrhizae, fungi, and roots, kind of hold pieces of soil together. So they make this intact kind of balls. What happens is that when there's rain or there's um, erosion, the soil is bare, if the soil aggregates are strong, if the soil is healthy, then when it rains, that soil aggregate doesn't break up. It doesn't fall apart. So what does that mean? That soil doesn't break up and doesn't fall apart? There's less erosion. There's less nutrient loss through leaching and through just plain nutrient loss through wash, getting washed away. So when you see um, soils that have been tilled over and over, organic matter has not been reincorporated, there's a very little mulch, the soil aggregate, um, the soil aggregates kind of break apart, becomes very, very bad soil structure. And that soil is very vulnerable to wind erosion, to, to water erosion, and to nutrient leaching. So there's relationship, the way we treat the soil, there's relationship with the air, there's relationship with the temperature, there's relationship with the plants, with the health. Of course, we cannot ignore the biological part. Oh, everything that I explained before was more the physical part. Now let's talk about the biological part of soil health. The first basis of soil health is plants, okay? Plants actually are the basis of everything, okay, in this earth. They are the ones that produce their, they, they produce the energy. They are the primary producers, okay? They do photosynthesis. You guys know this already. Plants get energy from the sun, okay? And with the air, with CO2, they produce organic matter. Well, that plant also drives soil biology because as plants, as there's roots, as there's dead plant, 
plant parts, let's say leaves fall in the soil, that provides food for microorganisms to decompose or to feed on, or um, root feeders like nematodes, etc. And that provides food for other organisms to feed on them, etc. And you get a whole food web. Now, what do you think might be the biggest driver of soil diversity? What, what, what's important to be diverse? To have high animal diversity or plant diversity? What do you think drives soil diversity? Plant diversity. Plant diversity is among many, many factors, it is one of the biggest drivers when you have a lot of plant diversity and plant abundance, then you tend to have a lot of soil diversity. And when you see here, you see nematodes at different areas. You see nematodes can be root feeders. Nematodes can also be fungal and bacterial feeders. Nematodes can also be predators. And nematodes can also be omnivores. That's why studying nematodes is a good way to get an idea of soil diversity because nematodes can perform so many different functions. By the way, nematodes is not a bad word. There is bad nematodes, but there's also good nematodes, okay? So why are, are nematodes excellent organi organisms to study ecosystem disturbance, diversity, structure, and function? Because they are all over the world. And just about every ecosystem, even in the Antarctica. They are in the tallest mountains and in the lowest valleys and in the ocean, okay? And they are extremely diverse. In a little bit of soil, in just one cup of soil, you can have hundreds of species and thousands of individuals. And those hundreds of species will have different functions. Some of them are herbivores, some of them are carnivores, some of them are fungivores, some of them are um, bacteriovores. So that way you have a whole ecosystem. You can study the ecosystem biodiversity, the function, just studying one animal group, just nematodes. That's why they are useful. Okay, so first of all, these are the herbivores. The herbivores, we consider them the bad guys, right? Because most of us like to garden. Who here gardens or farms? Okay, so since we all garden or farm, we have nematodes as our enemy, okay? Because they like to eat our plants, some of them. <coughs> okay, um, nematodes that are herbivores have a sharp stylet, a mouth part that feeds um, they insert this mouth part into the plant and then eject the plant juices. And when they make that injury, they make the plant vulnerable to disease. Okay, fungivores feed on fungi. And um, this one is a funny picture actually. This is a fungivore nematode and the female, the one that you see here, this is the tail, is dead and the eggs inside of her hatched and there you can see one, two, three young inside her. So at one moment it will burst up and all her babies are inside. So I, I, when I saw that, when I was looking in the microscope and saw that, I said, I need to get a picture of that. <laughs> Never seen a pregnant nematode before. <laughs> okay. Okay, omnivores are nematodes that feed on many things, on many, many microorganisms and and um, other nematodes, etc. They are, if you have a lot of omnivores, they tend to signal a healthy ecosystem, very diverse, because they are one of the first ones to, to die or to uh, go down when ecosystem is, is disturbed, okay? Carnivores are the predators. This is the lion of the nematodes. You can notice they have a big tooth, and that big tooth is used to peer, you know, when it grabs other nematodes, it, it kind of punctures them and then it sucks the juices. All this part in the middle, that's all muscle that it uses kind of to, to, um, to ingest the other nematode. Okay, 
So this is my research in Michigan. And that's the main objective. The objective was to understand the effect of physical and bio, um, uh, disturbance on physical and biological characteristics of ecosystems. So this is a picture of where it is. This is in Michigan. This is my, me, my husband, and my daughter. And, uh, and these three ecosystems, you can see there. By the way, this has been there for 30 years. Okay? This is a long-term ecological research station. That means they have been doing the same thing. They have had conventional till, no till, no input organic agriculture um, being tested for more than 30 years and testing things like organic matter, buildup of organic matter in the soil, nitrate grass release, um, soil aggregate stability, nematode populations, um, yield, pests, diseases, to figure out what are the effects, what are the long-term effects, both ecologically and for yield, what are the effects of these different management strategies, okay? Things like no-till, things like organic, things like um, systems like conventional, okay? And they also have forest ecosystems that have never been disturbed, and that is as a standard to know what it, you know, what it was like to kind of have a baseline and old field succession. At the same time that they set this up, they just, um, it was at these fields for agriculture and they just let them go to study, you know, what happens was there after eco, um, agriculture systems are abandoned, you know, plant succession and, and what happens to the soil biology, et cetera, and carbon accumulation. All right, and that's, Every single plot is one of these blue plots. That's what the agriculture is, is one hectare. So 100 meters by 100 meters. It's a very well-designed experiment funded by the NSF, National Science Foundation. Okay, so the results. Um, the results are mainly, this is kind of complicated, but I'll explain. Black means the highest level, yellow means the lowest level. And these are generally um, measurements of diversity. Um, this is absolute density, how many nematodes there was per sample. That's per cup of soil, okay, per cup of soil. Um, total nematode taxa, how many different types of nematodes, okay. Um, these are diversity measurements. So you can see in general the old field succession, the one that was abandoned, the field that was abandoned after agriculture, and the deciduous forest had the highest number of nematodes and the beneficial ones, and also the highest diversity. And there wasn't much significant difference between the agriculture ecosystems. Um, mainly, and I believe this, mainly because they were, they had similar crops. And plant diversity drives soil, soil diversity. So even though conventional tillage and no-till was receiving herbicides, pesticides, all that, it did not really affect the soil biology significantly. Not, not in this experiment, you know. It, 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 there is some experiments that do show it, but in mine I can only show what I got, you know. So, um, but it, it, it reinforces the knowledge that plant diversity drives um, soil diversity. Um, and this this is, a, um, this is a complicated analysis, but what it does, every single dot is a type of nematode. You can see the types of nematode that all the agricultural ecosystems have similar types of nematodes, while the forest and the successional fields have different kind of nematodes. I mean, they have different uh, types. And here you can also, and also you can see that pH, the pH tends to increase with agriculture and carbon and nitrogen tends to increase in deciduous forests or when they're, when they're abandoned. So nitrogen and carbon increases once you leave the thing alone, the plant and, 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 and nature takes over, especially in, in forest. If you look at here, this is the different types of nematodes. This is just by family. If I put it here by species, the list will go all the way to the sky. So if you put, if you put just, just by family, if you notice by family, the deciduous forest 
had 63 different, 67 different family in a cup of, an average per cup of soil. But the, um, but not very high, this is the number of nematodes for a cup of soil. So not very many nematodes, not, not a lot of abundance, but a lot of diversity. Does that make sense? Like you can have a room with 10 people, okay? One person can be from Afghanistan, the other one from Africa, the other one from China. Very diverse, right? But it's only 10 people. Or you can have a room of 100 people and they all come from Thailand, let's say. Do you, you understand? You can have very small number with high diversity. So here we have small number of nematodes. So um, a small density, low density, but high diversity. And that's actually ideal, okay? In this, in the agriculture uh, uh, systems, what we had, we had low diversity and we had a few nematodes that totally dominated. You can see that a lot of bars here are very wide. So you have a lot of domination. Certain species really do very well and um, I ma many, many of them are uh, plant parasites, okay? Plant parasites do very well, they're very abundant, while the other, um, the beneficials tend to go down. And you can see in the old field succession, you actually have tremendous high abundance and pretty high diversity, and that's because that had the greatest plant diversity. You have grasses, you had forbs, you had flowers, you have bushes, you know, and very dense, and in just a foot of soil, you can have who knows how many plants. You can't, you know, so many grasses, so many forbs, so huge diversity. Um, regarding Regarding yield, which is the most important part for us, yield was tended to be significantly higher in the no-tillage system, okay? And there was no significant difference between the conventional till and the organic low input. That means that all those fertilizers that they were adding in the conventional system were not really increasing yield. Just in the low input, they were just using cover crops and low input and they had um, similar yields as the conventional tillage, which is an important knowledge for farmers because you know, other you're, you're kind of throwing the money down the drain. Mm -hmm. So they say excessive use of fertilizer. The right amount is, right, is good, but you know, an excess, it doesn't really increase um, tillage. Okay, so conclusion, native ecosystems tend to have greater biodiversity, stability, and maturity compared to agriculture ecosystem. And management changes. Um, and that's, I have a website if you want to see the pictures of those nematodes. Okay? So I came to University of Hawaii and I did a research with Kun Hui Wang, Dr. Kun Hui Wang, in, in, in Oahu. And this was a similar research in a way, but it only measured agricultural ecosystems. We didn't um, measure any native ecosystems. This was only focused in agriculture ecosystems. And our crop was green onion. In Michigan State, I did um, soybean, corn, and wheat rotations. If any of you guys are from the Midwest, you're probably familiar with those rotations, huh? <laughs> yeah, big, big fields of corn or soybeans. Okay, so. So this was the four treatments that we compared. There was some overlapping between them in order to compare and contrast. Two of them had sun hemp cover crop. Who of you guys know what sun hemp is? Okay, a great majority, so I don't have to go into too much detail. But sun hemp is a cover crop. It's a plant that you plant before you plant your crop and then you incorporate it into the soil. It, it helps to control nematodes. It, it fixates nitrogen and it grows very well in Hawaii, okay? So we planted sun hemp cover crop, followed by, in this case, tillage and solarization. We put clear plastic, clear plastic, and then let the soil heat with the sun for about two weeks, um, or followed by no tillage. So you, we had, we had um, no till system, and we had tillage system, and this one had sun hemp, 
the, um, these two had sun hemp, these two don't have sun hemp. So these two had sun hemp cover crop. Um, this one is no-till. This, this is the only one no-till. This one is tillage. These two had solarization. The difference is that this one had solarization, but it had sun hemp cover crop and insectary border. Any of you guys know what insectary plants are? Insectary plants are plants that you plant in order to attract beneficial insects. They are gas stations for your good guys. Because a lot of these little microscopic wasps, they actually do not feed on your pest. They lay eggs on your pest. You know, on the aphids, on mealybugs that you were talking about. They go and lay their ovipositor. They have like a needle, you know, and they lay the eggs inside. And the larva eats it from the inside. Shin is the expert back there. He, he can, Shin Matayoshi, he's the expert on this. And that's right, so in the corner. So anyway, they lay the eggs, they lay the eggs inside, and, but they don't feed on the pest. That means that if they go, let's say your plant is far away and there's no flowers in the way, it's a suicide mission because they need to get some nectar. They need to get some sugar in the middle in order for them to have energy to get to your plant to parasitize your pest. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They need sugar, they need nectar in order to get energy. So if your plant, if your farm, let's say, has no flowers and no food for your biocontrol agents, they will not go there because it's a suicide mission, okay? And they are not into suicide missions, okay? <laughs> They're into surviving, okay? Okay. What, what the, are you using for the, the border? The border, cowpea. Mm -hmm. Cowpea is, um, is an excellent insectary crop, and it's not the flowers. Actually, cowpea produces little balls, on, little balls of carbohydrate on the stem and in different parts in order to attract beneficial insects in order to control its pest. How do so they, cowpea, have any of you guys eaten um, black eyed peas? Mm -hmm. Any of you guys eaten black eyed peas? Mm -hmm. Those are cowpeas, oh. uh, just that's, okay. Um, there's many different types of cowpeas, pretty much they all do the same thing. They're very good insectary crop. Another insectary crop that we put here, you see those white flowers? That's buckwheat. Buckwheat is also an excellent insectary crop, and um, it is easy to grow in Hawaii. Both cowpea and buckwheat is possible to grow in Hawaii. Okay? And the, the benefit of the cowpea is that you can eat the pods. Mm -hmm. okay? So you can, yes? I have a question about buckwheat. It, doesn't that attract the root well, a lot of crops are attracted. Root knot nematodes are not very picky about what they eat. Um, pretty much the only w crops that are not attractive to root knot nematodes are grasses. So um, in general, if um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, put that as your first priority when you plant, a, uh, when you plant an insectary plant. Wait, but if, well, if you want to manage nematodes well, if you plant sun hemp before you plant your crop and incorporate it into the soil, that'll help to bring your nematodes numbers down, okay? Um, um, a lot of these crops can also be fed on by root knot nematodes, yes? How can you uh, plant sun hemp, sun hemp in a uh, no-till environment if you're suggesting we should till it in? Okay, so, okay, that's a good point. For sun hemp to kill nematodes, it needs to be tilled in. If it is just grown and then laid on top as mulch, it does not control nematodes, but it does help soil health. And eventually, the nematode numbers are lower because of biocontrol. So you, um, in a way, you need to kind of choose, okay? You need to choose, and that's why this is a country of liberty, right? Freedom of choice, right? You can choose. You want no till. You don't want. You you, you you want to do no till. You want to do tillage. You are freedom. You are free to choose. There are some benefits of tillage, and there are some downsides of tillage. If you um, tillage has some, 
definite benefits, you know, for controlling weeds and also it, just by the fact of tilling kind of controls some nematodes, etc. But it does have a lot of environmental um, concerns. So, yes. Can you, would you possibly get any of those nematode killing properties from sun hemp if you cut it, laid it on the surface, and then covered it with another source <coughs> of mulch to trap whatever that property is close yeah. to the soil? There's no evidence of that. Um, there's no evidence of that. There, um, if you do solarization on top, if you put clear plastic, yes. You know, because that, that'll kind of trap the gases. It would be a plastic mulch instead of a, okay. And also it'll increase the heat. The most important thing, increase the heat. Okay, this is bare ground. You can see conventional tillage, insecticides, everything. And bare ground, so these two are equivalent. They're the same. The difference is that this one we use solarization plastic and this one we didn't. So results. This is a busy table, but I'll just break it down to you. Really simple. Um, the system that had um, sun hemp and um, mulch, because, oh, by the way, the ones that had sun hemp, you know, the, 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 uh, the no-till, we did exactly that. We cut the sun hemp and put it around the plant as a mulch. So what happened with the mulch, that system had higher diversity, and it was significant. You can see, you can see significant higher number of, um, of, of, um, Fungivores, bacteriovores, etc. There's there is significant solarization significantly reduced. Solarization significantly reduced diversity. But it also reduced herbivores, which is the bad plant pest. But something interesting happened with solarization. The number of pests really went down, but after a while, the numbers really increased to levels. If you look here at solarization, look at here. When after solarization, we had 217, much high, much lower than sun hemp. That's the one with no till. We started with 1,000, 1,060 nematodes per cup of soil. That's in the first sampling on the no till, because we didn't, we didn't till in the sun hemp. We didn't do solarization. We didn't do any nematode management strategy. We started with 1,060. And the one that we did sun hemp solarization or solarization plane, sun hemp solarization, we got down to 80 nematodes per cup of the plant parasites, the bad ones. So it really, really reduced them. But what happened? Look at here, the plane solarization. Another thing I want to contrast here, the sun hemp solarization, when you added the cover crop and the solarization, we got down to 80, but it was plain plastic, plain clear plastic, we got down to 217. So the sun hemp helped to reduce the number some more. But you can see here the plain solarization, the first sample date, 217, then second sample date, 855, third sample date, 2550. So what's happening to the populations? Skyrocket. So what happened is we've killed the biological control, and their numbers actually rise to be higher than any of, see, in the sun hemp, we're still to 1,030. So we, in the no-till sun hemp, we're still in the same number. We've stayed flat. But in the solarization, and the third sample date, which was our harvest date, we had double and a half, 150% higher number of plant parasitic nematodes, the bad guys, than in the one that we didn't do anything. So that's why biocontrol is important. Do you see the benefit of biocontrol? Okay. So in order to kind of outweigh this, if you're going to use solarization to kill your nematodes, you need to reincorporate beneficials. And you can reincorporate beneficials by adding compost, by adding manure. The IMO situation might work, but probably not, because you need very complex organisms, things like nematode trapping fungi and other predator, you know, ne um, predator nematodes and other things like that, and they would be in whole soil and whole compost situations. They wouldn't be, um, the, like, the, like when you do the fermentation, that's mainly lactobacillus and, you know, mainly bacteria, which are very good, but they wouldn't be the ones doing this job. So you want to increase, but that would be used by things like, Compost, vermicompost tea, or um, organic matter of some kind. Okay. I'm not saying that IMO is bad. I think it's 
that, that's fine, but I'm just saying in this situation, for killing nematodes, you need things like nematode trapping fungi and predator nematodes. All right, so. Could you explain again the, what the BG abbreviation is? Bare ground. Bare ground. Bare ground, this is sun hemp, sun hemp no till. This is sun hemp solarization, you know, sun hemp, and you saw the plastic on top. And this is the um, plain solarization, it's like conventional everything, but with solarization. Okay. So what happened to the pest weeds and beneficials? Thrips, um, the, plain, the plain black line with the squares means sun hemp with no tillage. All the systems, all the systems that had tillage and didn't have mulch around the plants had higher number of thrips. The, the, the system with mulch and no till you know, the sun hemp, we had had sun hemp, and then we put the sun hemp mulch around the plant, and it wasn't tilled. The number of thrips, but much lower, and the number kind of decreased in every sampling day. And this was significant. And this is not the first time it's been reported. There's a lot of reports of thrip numbers going down with the use of mulch, or keeping the soil covered. In part, because many thrips pupate in the soil. And when they pupate, they're also vulnerable to fungal infections and to other diseases that kind of brings their population down. And mulch keeps the soil moist, it keeps the soil cool, and it kind of promotes this environment where um, all these beneficial organisms that can kill the thrips, you know, they can thrive. Leaf miners also, lower leaf miners, when it was a peak season, when there was the most leaf miners, you know leaf miners are the ones that, let me see, I can show you a picture. Here, leaf miners calls the swirly line, okay? There was significantly less leaf miners in the systems that the system that had sun hemp and mulch around the plant. Also, there was significantly less uh, alternaria pori, which is purple blotch, which is a fungal disease. And this is very simple, why? You know, if you have the soil covered with mulch, yes, Okay, finish. Okay, so um, I didn't finish. Oh, I, I just uh, one point. Solarization really helped with weed control. You can notice here, um, almost no weeds. Look at the conventional system, full of weeds. Um, so significant. And no-till, sun hemp, the system that reduced the pest also significantly increased yield. Okay, because we all want, so this is the main conclusions. And so if we worry about soil health and preserving those beneficial soil organisms, it increases yield, it decreases pest, decreases diseases, and it helps the environment. Okay.